Am I good? Okay, I am uh, part of a PRAC team, and uh, the computational part of this team involves a collaboration between what we call the Embody Shop, mainly based at the University of Washington, and the Parallel Programming Lab at uh, University of Illinois, uh, particularly their Charm++ Plus Plus, uh, programming uh, environment and runtime system. <clears throat> Here's an outline of the talk, and alongside my points, I've drawn connections to the points we are meant to talk about. Uh, understand that I've had a previous PRAC, PRAC allocation that focused on populations of galaxies. I now have a new PRAC, which is about galaxies and clusters, and obviously there's a connection. I need the results of my first PRAC in order to actually model those galaxies uh, in the cluster context. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so the problem of galaxy formation is to make one of these. And hopefully, uh, observing one of these will tell us about uh, how dark matter is distributing. And since uh, Professor Toth is in the uh, audience, point out that the flatness of the of our of these spiral galaxies tells us about how clumpy the infall of dark matter. He taught us about that a couple decades ago. Uh, but what you see here is not the dark matter. You see stars, and uh, and pretty much every aspect of this image, right? There's starlight here. The red image uh, dots are photoionization regions, and the photons come from stars, you can see an obscuration from dust here. The dust is made in stars. So understanding how the stars form and evolve is fundamental to understanding how uh, a galaxy works. And star formation is hard, okay? You have molecular clouds that collapse via their uh, gravitational instabilities. There's magnetic fields running around, radiative transfer, molecular and dust chemistry, which complicates both of these things. Um, there's turbulence, which is both driven at large scales by the differential rotation of the galaxy, but it's also driven by small scale, on small scales by the supernova explosions, and you've got to capture all that uh, hydrodynamics. And you've got to resolve this inside a cosmological simulation. <clears throat> and just a pictorial representation, uh, you know, this image is uh, tens of kiloparsecs across. If we're to zoom in to an individual star formation region, it's four kiloparsecs across, and, and the colors here are velocities. So you have this molecular gas moving around on very small time scale, uh, uh, distance scales. So you need resolution. Uh, and so we try to maximize our resolution, but we still have to capture the cosmology, which gives you the rotation of the galaxy. Uh, and within a galaxy, we have to resolve down to at least the molecular cloud level, which is around uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses. Somehow we've got to capture that uh, star formation. We can't resolve individual stars, so we have to have a subgrid model for that. Uh, which I outline here, and then we have to tune our model to mitigate problems with under-resolution. <clears throat> and so there's a little tuning to it, but we have present-day stellar populations that we can match with. So with the PRAC, we did this for a population of galaxies. We are able to uh, give pretty good uh, representations of galaxies. This is an undergraduate at the University of Washington, did some post-processing of, of our simulations. We get pretty good morphologies. More importantly, we get good morphologies over a range of masses and time scales. <clears throat> we get some galaxies that are star forming early on. Later on, we get galaxies that are quenched. Their star formation has petered out. Uh, a particular aspect of covering this population is also understanding the black hole in the center of the galaxy because feedback from that supermassive black hole seems to be required to quench uh, large galaxies. And so uh, uh, graduate student Michael Tremel has um, implemented a uh, AGN model where we form black holes in primordial gas 
these black holes grow from accreting gas, and we follow the merger of the black holes uh, within the galaxies that merge together. And with the recent gravitational wave results, the merging of the black holes is now important to un uh, understand because of its observational consequences. And so if, as far as modeling populations of galaxies, one thing to get right is the star formation efficiency over a range of galaxy masses. And that's what I plot here. We have uh, dark matter halo mass on the bottom axis, going from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 13. And essentially, this vertical axis is the star formation efficiency. Think of it as a fraction of the baryons in a halo that turn into stars. Turns out the Milky Way sized galaxies tend to be the most efficient. Uh, efficiency decreases both at the low end, we understand that from supernova feedback, tend to be more effective down there. But at the high end, this is where we need supermassive black holes in order to drive down the efficiency at higher uh, wavelengths. The points are from our, uh, our flagship uh, simulation from our previous PRAC, and the curves are observations. And so we're quite pleased that we are able to match observations over a wide range of masses. <clears throat> Furthermore, we have black holes. There are other relationships that the black holes have. So there's this observed relationship between the stellar mass of a galaxy and the mass of the central black hole. And we get both the uh, observed relationship at high um, black hole masses, and also there's an observed scatter of this relationship at the lower masses, which we also reproduced. And again, uh, this is recent work uh, that was just published based on our previous PRAT. And then there's stuff that, you know, we have this uh, population of galaxies. There's a lot of things we can dig out of it. And some unexpected result is looking at the velocity distribution of the dark matter in individual halos, in particular our Milky Way. We have uh, more than a dozen Milky Way-like galaxies in our, in our population. We can look at the velocity distribution, and the reason this is important is that if the dark matter was a Pechi Quinn axion, and that's Helen Quinn, um, then you would be able to measure the kinetic energy of the dark matter exquisitely via uh, these uh, axion dark matter experiments. And so a uh, graduate student at the University of Washington uh, measured the velocity distribution of the halos in our simulation and noted that the, the velocity distribution is significantly more peaked than, uh, than the experiments uh, originally assumed, and that's what the, uh, the dashed line is. So we have a new model for what the velocity distribution function uh, is. And then we can apply that to the uh, constraint diagrams from the experiment. So um, again, this is uh, mass of the potential dark matter uh, axion. Uh, this is the uh, coupling constant of the uh, axion to standard model physics. A couple of minimal models are these diagonal lines here, and the uh, the shaded region here is the constraints from the ADMX experiment uh, running at the University of Washington. With our new model, based on, the, on, on our PRAC simulation, notice that the shaded region gets extended downwards. Okay, so this, uh, this translates into real dollars because it takes, right, the area of this shaded region is determined by how long you run the experiment. And so if we can run the experiment shorter, you're saving, it's probably a burn rate of a million dollars a year or more. So that, that's an a, a unexpected quant, uh, consequence of having a population of galaxies. Okay, moving on to our new PRAC. We're studying uh, clusters. And um, probably Tiziana already told us the great things that uh, uh, clusters are. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that 
uh, with this picture is unlike our, ga our galaxy, most of the baryons in a cluster is observable in x-rays. And so the red here is x-ray emission because the gas is concentrated and hot enough to be, vi uh, to be visible. This is not true for our own galaxy. And another thing is that presumably supernova can blow gas out of a galaxy and we can just blow it away and forget about it. We can't forget about the gas in a cluster because the cluster potential as a whole holds that gas in. So whatever the galaxy produces has to uh, stay in the, in the cluster and we should be able to observe it. However, there's a computational challenge. Remember, I want a unified model. That means I have to get the star formation right in the galaxies and that star formation is determined by that physical scale molecular cloud scale, but I want to model a cluster that is a billion times larger or more. And, you can, uh, and so that tells you how many resolution elements you need. And furthermore, what makes it even tougher is all the computation that you do is clustered. It's inside the cluster. So you have lots of computation, but it's, um, it's, uh, the domain is quite confined. So how are we tackling this? Uh, we have this highly scalable code that we call Changa, has all the bells and whistles that we need, the, the physics, to follow both the star formation and the supermassive black holes. Uh, it's built on this uh, runtime system called Charm++. Uh, James Bordner told you a little bit about uh, Ch uh, Charm++ a, uh, a couple days ago. But the idea is that um, we can overlap communication and communication via these asynchronous uh, methods. And more importantly, the Charm++ runtime system can handle that load balancing of the highly clustered uh, computation. For uniform volumes, our code scales very nicely. Uh, this is half a million of the integer cores on blue waters here getting 90% uh, efficiency, uh, but the universe is very clustered, uh, and clusters are even more clustered. And so you've got a few problems. I've already mentioned this one. Another thing is that the computation per resolution element also varies widely. Uh, so you have this extra load imbalance, and you have this extra communication uh, imbalance. So if you look at a cluster, so this is the dark matter uh, distribution of a small piece. So the, this is just the center part of my simulation where the cluster is. I'm just showing the gravitational potential. Those are the particles. Here I'm showing computational elements. Each point is a char, so a group of about 1,000 particles, and the color is the load, computational load, as measured by the Charm++ runtime system. So if you just try to load balance this by evenly distributing the particles across uh, blue waters, you get a load diagram that looks like this. So this is uh, utilization, in this case, of 8,000 processors as a function of time over 30 seconds. See that there's a lot of work to be done, but then there's this long tail. So white means nothing's going on. That's bad. Uh, so we let the, run uh, uh, the Charm++ runtime system rebalance based on the computational load. And now we shrink that 29 seconds down to 16 seconds because we have the, we're able to, again, this is the runtime system uh, doing its job. So with that, we, we th uh, so this is a simulation essentially one-tenth scale of what we ultimately want to run on uh, Blue Waters. So this is, gives us encouragement that we can scale to the full machine. Uh, we think we're getting the physics right, so just preliminary result about the physics. We know we can get the galaxies right. We're worried about the intra-cluster medium, the hot gas between the galaxies, and thus, so this point here is showing that we get the gas temperature uh, as a function of the mass of the cluster comparable to uh, observational results. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So just some uh, takeaways. Again, clusters are hard. We have one scale set by star formation physics. That's much, many more, many orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the scale of the cluster, which is 1,000 galaxies or so in size. In size, we have this extra uh, challenge that our computational load is also highly clustered, but we think we can address it. There's stuff we haven't addressed yet. In particular, both magnetic fields and cosmic rays are likely to be important in, in, in the intracluster medium. So I encourage you to stick around for Irina Butsky's talk uh, next. Uh, she will talk about that. But uh, with the uh, capability machines that we have in Blue Waters and intelligent runtime systems to distribute the load, I think that uh, this project will be doable. So with that, I'll give my uh, acknowledgments, uh, both from NSF, NASA Computing, and particularly uh, Blue Waters for enabling this research. And I thank you for listening.